This video covers all the essentials of simple linear regression in R. This will be the first in a series of videos on linear regression. I will start by explaining what simple linear regression is and how you can do it in R. I'll show what the intercept, the slope, and the residuals are, and then I will show you how you can use the residuals to perform diagnostics. If these reveal no issues, then you can use the regression table to obtain useful information about the model you fitted. I will emphasize one of these in this video, which is the amount of variance explained by your model, or R squared. In the next video, I'll explain how the estimates are actually obtained. In short, simple linear regression estimates a line that shows how one continuous variable changes when the other does. If the line goes up, then there is a positive linear correlation between the two, and if the line goes down, there is a negative linear correlation. If the line is more or less flat, then the two variables are not linearly correlated. We can describe the line as an intercept and a slope. The intercept is the value of the response variable when the explanatory variable is equal to zero. The slope is the amount with which the response variable increases when the explanatory variable increases by one. In other words, a simple linear model says that for each observation, the response variable is equal to the intercept plus the slope times that observation's value of the explanatory variable plus some individual deviation from the line. Here is an example of what I mean. The intercept is where x is equal to zero, which in this model is at y equals three. The slope is how much y increases when x increases by one. This is equal to 0 0.25 in this example. So for every unit increase of x, y increases by 0 0.25. Let's go through a step-by-step -step example analysis using simple linear regression. For this example, let's say that we have measurements of body fat percentage and BMI of 20 mils. There are cheap and fast methods of getting an estimate of your body fat percentage, for example with bioelectric impedance analyzers, like the ones you often see on weighing scales with metal contact points. Getting accurate measurements, however, can only be done through expensive or time-consuming methods like dual x-ray or water submersion, etc. BMI, on the other end, is very easy to measure. So if there is a strong linear correlation between the two, then perhaps in a larger study, you could use BMI as a proxy for body fat percentage. The first step is to read your data into R. Here I've shown how to make a data frame from the example data, but you could also of course read your data from an Excel file. The second step I always recommend is to try and make some relevant plot of your data. Here I've shown a scatter plot with body fat percentage on the y-axis and BMI on the x-axis. This already shows that there is more or less a linear relationship. When BMI goes up, then on average body fat percentage also appears to go up. We can also see that although there appears to be a linear trend, there is still a lot of unexplained variance. The third step is to actually fit the model. For this we're going to use the base R function called LM. Here I have created an object called capital LM by making a call to the LM function with body fat percentage as the response variable and BMI as the explanatory variable. The last argument tells R where to find these variables namely in the data frame we just created. Before we use this model for any kind of inference though, we have to consider its assumptions. Like most statistical methods, simple linear regression is only appropriate under certain assumptions about the data generating process. These are in descending order of importance, the measurements are independent, there is indeed a linear relationship between the two variables, the error in the equation y equals intercept plus slope times x plus error comes from a normal distribution, and the variance of this error is more or less the same anywhere along the regression line. This last assumption is by the way also called homogeneity of variance or homostatisticity, which might come in handy if you read literature about this subject. Finally, what is often mentioned alongside the assumptions because it is very important is that you have to check for the presence of outliers. If there are any high leverage outliers, then they will have a strong effect on the estimates. We can check the assumptions and the presence of outliers through model diagnostics. These are a set of plots of the residuals. If you've watched the video on ANOVA, the diagnostic plots are very similar. I will also go in a bit more depth on this topic in the video on model diagnostics. What are the residuals then? 
Here is an illustration. If we have our data and we have our model, then the residuals are the differences between the actual outcome and the outcome as predicted by our model. In other words, for simple linear regression, the residuals are equal to the vertical distances to the line. We can take all those vertical distances from the model and make a histogram or a density plot like the one I've shown here. So on average, they are zero, most of them are close to zero, and few are further away. But it is rather hard to tell whether any assumption is violated just by looking at this. There are two bumps, which is not a feature of the normal distribution. But then again, these are only residuals of 20 observations. So is this really not approximately normal? That is why we use diagnostic plots. They make it a lot easier to see what's going on. The diagnostic plots are nothing more than a bunch of different ways to plot the residuals, for the purpose of easily identifying violated assumptions. In this particular example, there are no apparent issues with the assumptions made. I will quickly go over the interpretation of each plot before showing you some examples of violated assumptions. In the upper left plot is the residuals versus fitted plot. It shows the spread of the residuals along the regression line. We can use it to check for nonlinearity, like a quadratic relationship, which would show up as a parabolic shape. We can also see that the variance of the residuals is more or less constant, because the distances to the gray dashed line are more or less of the same magnitude going from left to right. The plot below it is called the skill location plot. It can give an easier indication of whether the variance is more or less constant, because it plots the transformation of the residuals that causes them all to be positive. If there were a non-constant variance, then we would see a clear trend going up or down. In this particular example, the red smoothing line appears to go up slightly, but this is hardly a problematic example. The upper right plot is a quantile-quantile plot for deviations from a theoretical distribution. If the observations fall outside the 95% confidence bands, which are the red dashed lines, then there will be a significant deviation from normality. Here, all residuals nicely fall within a 95% confidence interval. The last plot is a bit more different than what you've seen so far in ANOVA. This plot is a combination of the Cook's distance and the leverage. If you'll remember, the Cook's distance is a measure of outlyingness. Outlyingness means the extent to which the observation seems to disagree with the model. But if an observation is outlying, that doesn't necessarily mean that it strongly affects the estimates. If it is near the center, then it probably doesn't have any effect at all. This is why we plot against the leverage, which means how hard an observation actually pulls on the estimates. There is only a problem if an observation is both an outlier and has high leverage. Now you're probably wondering, you can see the leverage on the x-axis, but where is the Cook's distance? What happens is that R automatically zooms in so that all the observations fall nicely within the plotting window. In this case, the border that represents the Cook's distance of a half or one is not even within the screen, so none of the observations are remotely close to being outliers. What do violated assumptions then look like? Here is one example. What do you think is going on here? You can pause the video if you want and I'll reveal the answer in a moment. If you look at the upper left plots, you can clearly make out a parabolic shape. This is what it looks like when you try to fit a linear model when the true relationship is actually quadratic. In the lower left plot, we also see one observation with high leverage because it is all the way to the right. It has a Cook's distance of more than a half, as you can see from the boundary indicated by the red dashed line. This isn't an outlier though. It is just that the parabolic shape differs more and more from the linear shape the further away you go from the line. Next example. What do you think is going on here? Again, you can pause the video if you want and I'll reveal the answer in a moment. Shown here is a response variable that comes from a discrete probability distribution. In this case, a binomial distribution. You can see this from the large gap that appears in the QQ plot. The gap is also visible in the residual versus fitted plot. This is because this response variable only takes on a few possible values. For this response variable, conditional normality is clearly not a reasonable assumption. Here is another example. What is the problem in this case? You can pause the video and I'll reveal the answer shortly.
This is a clear example of non-constant variance. The residuals versus fitted plot shows a clear cone shape. As the fitted values increase, so does the extent to which the residuals differ from the regression line. The same is visible in the scale location plot. There is a very clear upwards trend. In the lower right plot, there is one observation with high leverage. It pulls the regression line towards it. However, this observation is not beyond the 0.5 or 1.0 boundaries of the Cook's distance. So it is in agreement with the other observations and does not pose a problem. Last example. We've already had all three other problems, so you can probably guess what the issue is here. This is what a problematic outlier looks like. Now we can see both the boundaries of the Cook's distance of 0.5 and 1.0. The observation mark 19 is beyond the 1.0 boundary of the Cook's distance, and it also has the greatest leverage of all observations. So this would certainly warrant further inspection of this observation. What to do then in case of violated assumptions is basically the same as with ANOVA. If your measurements are not independent, then you shouldn't be using a simple linear model in the first place. A mixed model can be used instead. In case normality is not a reasonable assumption, then there are regression models that allow for different probability distributions, like the generalized linear model or generalized additive models. Mild deviations from normality are usually not a problem, you can use the simulation I've included in Elements of Biostatistics section 2.3.5 to get an indication of how large a deviation is still considered mild. Just like with ANOVA, non-constant variance in itself is the least problematic violation. However, it is often an indication of an underlying problem, like multiplicative effects instead of additive effects. If so, it can often be resolved through transformation, and if not you can resort to robust regression. Problematic outliers are the most difficult to deal with. A high Cook's distance is not enough reason to remove an observation. Removal is only warranted if you can justify the reason. Possible reasons could be corrupted entries or errors in experimentation. But if you cannot explain why the observation is outlying, then you should leave it in the data and use robust regression for example. That was a long detour, but I just want to emphasize the importance of being able to defend your choice of model before drawing any conclusions from it. Once you get past that point, you can easily generate a useful regression table with the summary function. You can run summary, open bracket, your model name and then close bracket, and you will see something like the following. First we see what R has actually done. A call to LM with the formula we specified and the data we supplied. You might be wondering what the point of this is, but if you had several models to compare, then it's good to know which one you're looking at now. Then we see a very simple summary of the residuals. In my opinion, you can completely ignore this if you've already performed visual diagnostics, but let me explain what it says anyway. Your residuals are the remaining distances to the regression line. You expect these to be normally distributed with a mean of zero. If that is the case, then the first and third quartiles should be of similar distance from zero, because the normal distribution is symmetric. You also expect that the median is equal to the mean, so it should be close to zero. If the minimum or maximum are extremely different in size, then perhaps there is an outlier. Again, this is a crude summary, and the visual diagnostics provide much more insight into the validity of your model assumptions. Next we see the important part, the coefficients tab. This is probably what you're most interested in. In the first column we see the estimate of the intercept, which is about 0.02 here, and the estimate of the slope, which is about equal to 0.99 here. In the next column we see the standard error of these estimates. If the standard error is relatively large compared to the estimate, then the estimate is imprecise, and if the standard error is relatively small, then the estimate is precise. The next column is the t-value of a one-sample t-test for whether the estimate differs significantly from zero. You can calculate this value simply by dividing the estimate by its standard error. The last column gives the p-value for this t-test. The t-test for the intercept is rarely interesting, but the p-value for the slope answers an interesting question. Namely, does the response variable increase or decrease significantly when the explanatory variable increases? In this case, the p-value is quite small, so you would conclude a significant linear relationship. 
Underneath the coefficients tab, there are simplifications of the p-value. These don't add any extra meaning, so you can just ignore them. Lastly then is some additional information about our model. First we see the residual standard error, which is a measure of how much variance is left in the outcome after subtracting the model. This value in itself isn't particularly interesting in simple linear regression, but it will become important for multiple linear regression, where we can use it to check for under or overfitting. The same goes for the degrees of freedom. All it tells us is that after using one degree of freedom for the intercept and one for the slope, there are 18 left, because our sample size was 20. Then we get to another value that can be very important to your conclusion. Multiple r squared is the proportion of variance in the outcome explained by this model. If it is close to zero, then there is a very weak linear association, and if it is close to one, then there is a very strong linear association. The adjusted r squared is irrelevant for simple linear regression, but will be introduced when we talk about multiple linear regression. Lastly, we see something that you've probably heard of before, an omnibus test. Again, this test is useful for multiple linear regression, where you have more than one effect. But here, answering the question if there is any effect is the same as asking whether there's an effect of BMI. And therefore, you'll see that in simple linear regression, this p-value is always identical to that of the slope. So what does this all mean? What do we conclude with regards to the research question? First of all, we estimated the intercept and the slope to see how body fat percentage changes on average when BMI does. Second, we expressed how much of the variance in body fat percentage is explained by BMI, namely 39.7%. We can even perform significance tests with simple linear regression. If the slope is significantly non-zero, then there is a significant relationship between body fat percentage and BMI. What about the intercept? If your BMI were zero, you would weigh zero kilograms and you would be dead. So how do we interpret the intercept here? When the data do not extend all the way to x is zero, then more often than not, it is not safe to just extrapolate the linear relation all the way to the intercept. In such cases, and thus also in this example, you should think of the intercept more as an anchor point for the fitted line rather than some meaningful value. You can also almost always ignore the p-value for the intercept, unless it is directly of interest to your research question whether the outcome is non-zero when the explanatory variable is zero. In the end then, does this model make sense? Well, of course not, because the line doesn't stop anywhere. It can still predict the body fat percentage of a man with a BMI of 100 or 1000 or minus 10, and of course, those predictions aren't realistic. But purely, for estimating the average change in body fat percentage with change in BMI within the range of these data, this is a useful model. And then we can go back to the original research question. Can we use BMI in place of body fat percentage? BMI explains only 39.7% of the variance in body fat percentage in these 20 individuals. So we can conclude that BMI alone probably isn't going to be a great substitute for measurements of body fat percentage. As a final step, I highly encourage that you try and plot your model. Simple linear regression only has two variables, so we can summarize the entire analysis in a single plot, and you can even add the amount of variance that this model explains. You could also add a few extra lines of code and plot a prediction interval. Unlike a confidence interval, a prediction interval actually shows you where you would expect 95% of the possible observations. This is also explained in the book. In summary then, a typical analysis with simple linear regression works as follows. Enter your data, plot your data, fit a simple linear model, perform visual diagnostics, check the regression table, and report your conclusion, for which I recommend you include a plot of your model. And that concludes the first part of this series.